in my hand is the RetroTINK 4K. Uh, at least a beta tester of the RetroTINK 4K. The final retail release is going to look like this. It's really sharp. This is RetroTINK's latest and greatest next generation analog to digital video scaler. This chunky boy will be released to the public in December of 2023 for $750. And to my left is a professional cathode ray tube. Specifically, this is a Sony PVM14M1J. Can the RetroTank 4K make retro gamers finally move on from CRTs for good? Let's find out. We are off the record. I'm 8-Bit Esquire, and if you've been following my channel for the last few months, you'll know that I was lucky enough to get a beta tester uh, of the RetroTINK 4K. I don't know why Mike Chi sent me this. I genuinely have zero technical skills whatsoever. I don't have any exotic arcade boards or classic PCs to test on this thing, and certainly not making any profiles for this guy. I just sit here in my basement making crappy YouTube videos uh, about video games that I just don't have time to actually play. While making my last episode of On Trial, I posed the question of whether or not the RetroTank 4K can emulate the CRT experience so well that we can finally consider getting rid of these old radiation boxes. Mike Chi touched upon this topic for us in that episode, but I want to take a closer look at the advantages CRTs have over analog to digital scalers and just how much more the RetroTank 4K closes that gap. But first, this video has been brought to you by a sponsor. Yes, this video has been brought to you by our friends at PCBWay.com. If you're an aspiring developer looking to make, I don't know, maybe the next great video scaler or any other device, uh, check out PCBWay.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything from circuit board production, 3D printing, CNC machining, injection molding, and even sheet metal fabrication. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional developer, PCB Way can meet all of your production needs. Please support the people that support this channel. Check them out at PCBWay.com. A link is in the description below. <laughs> Cathode ray tubes. They are my preferred way to play retro video games. And they've always had three real distinct advantages over the video scalers that have appeared on the market over the last few years. Even the amazing RetroTINK 5X that was released in 2021. First, CRTs give you that authentic 240p look with scan lines that really capture the developer's intent behind the artwork you see in these video games. Secondly, CRTs handle motion so much better than digital, modern, pixel-based displays because there's visible motion blur that can be distracting for some gamers. And finally, latency. CRTs are virtually lag-free and are the preferred monitors for speedrunners and professional gamers where every single frame of animation is crucial for their success. But now we have this guy, the RetroTINK 4K. Do CRTs still hold those same advantages over this next generation scaler? Let's look at how the RetroTINK 4K produces that authentic 240p look that CRT gamers love. Retro video games like Super Punch-Out here were made for televisions that would actually draw the image onto phosphors in a progressive fashion, meaning that only half of the tube's visible field would be used to display the image. This is referred to simply as 240p. For years, scalers have simply just drawn a black line in alternating rows on your digital display to emulate the 240p look, and it just didn't look quite right, especially if you sat really close to the screen and compared it to sitting really close to a CRT, because no CRT television actually drew straight black lines for 240p content. Aperture grills like this Sony PVM here, slot masks and shadow masks, all had really distinct looks for 240p content that varied in intensity based upon the TV line count found in the monitor. This look could actually be captured really well on a CRT by using a lens like this. This is my trusty Nikon uh, 60 millimeter macro lens. And with these lenses, I can get really, really close to the tube and remain in focus so I can capture 
how the phosphors are being illuminated on the inside of the tube. These shots that you're seeing right here were taken off of two 600 TV line Sony PVMs. First, there's this shot from Contra Hardcore, which is being shown on a Sony PVM 1942Q. And then there's this shot of Super Mario Brothers, which is being shown uh, on this Sony PVM 14M1J to my left. In these pictures, you can see the detail in the phosphors being illuminated by the electron beams as they pass through Sony's aperture grill. Now the old RetroTINK did a decent job of replicating this look as Mike Chi had programmed dozens of scanline filters into the device. And from a distance, Mike Chi's 600 TVL PVM filter looked really close to this 600 TVL PVM sitting right next to it. But when we start to get closer, the 1080p output of the Tink 5X just cannot accurately recreate the look of the phosphors being illuminated on the inside of the screen. But now we have the RetroTINK 4K and the extra resolution in this scaler gets us even that much closer to replicating the phosphors on a CRT. When you get really, really close, you can see that the 600 TVL filter looks so much more accurate now than the scalers of yesterday. I mean, just look at how close these OLED pixels look to the CRT phosphors. This is freaking incredible. And you may be thinking to yourself, okay, dude, no one actually sits that close to the screen when they sit and play video games. And you're 100% right. This comparison is probably really stupid and probably a little insane and a giant waste of time, yet I don't know, man. I posted this tweet on Twitter and over 180,000 of you looked at this tweet showing off exactly what the RetroTINK 4K was capable. So I don't know, man, some of you guys might actually care about this crap. And trust me, the accuracy found at the phosphor level really pays off when you're sitting back on the sofa. I have a 600 TVL HDR profile loaded up and playing on the RetroTINK 4K on this 65 inch OLED panel behind me. And that panel is sitting next to an actual 600 TV line Sony PVM. And they look indistinguishable from one another. Really, the camera is not doing this shot any justice. It really has to be seen to be believed. The RetroTINK 4K is essentially giving me a 65 inch professional video monitor hanging on my wall. It's that good. But if the look of a high-end PVM isn't your thing, there are some extremely talented programmers right now currently working on profiles for accurate recreations of some well-known consumer CRTs as well. So can the RetroTINK 4K successfully emulate the 240p look? It absolutely can. And in my opinion, CRTs no longer have this advantage over scalers thanks to the RetroTINK 4K. Next, let's talk about motion blur. Sure, the RetroTINK 4K can give us super accurate results with still images like I showed you in the last segment, but a moving picture is a entirely different animal because digital displays introduce motion blur when CRTs do not. Let's take a look at Super Mario Bros. on this PVM 14M1J. When playing the capture at 100% speed, you don't see any motion blur. And even if I slow Mario down to 10% speed, you still can't detect any motion blur from the CRT. Modern televisions and computer monitors used fixed pixels to display their image, which differ greatly from an electron beam drawing an image across a phosphorescent tube. Digital displays configure their pixels to show an image and then hold that image until the screen refreshes. On a 60 hertz television, the image is held for a full 1 60th of a second. Then the screen refreshes and a new image is held by the pixel for another 60th of a second. Let's take a look at Super Mario Brothers again. This time with the RetroTINK 5X outputting 1080p at 60 hertz. If you're not that sensitive to motion blur, you may not notice it when this video game is being played at 100% speed. But let's slow Mario down to 10% speed. You can clearly see the motion blur. This is the sample and hold technique of pixel displays in action. A perfect analogy to this is in photography. Setting your camera to a slower shutter speed will blur your subject, typically used for intentional artistic effect, like blurring the water that's spraying from this water fountain. However, setting your camera to a higher shutter speed will completely eliminate the blur 
from your moving subject, like my son here who's running during his soccer game. So if you have a monitor with a refresh rate faster than 60 hertz, you have an opportunity to greatly reduce the amount of motion blur you see on your video games. When it comes to gaming, the best way to combat this issue thus far has been the introduction of black frame insertion, where literally a black frame is being introduced in between each pixel refresh to drastically reduce the motion blur we see in flat panel displays. And behind me, I have a 120 hertz LG G1 OLED panel, where black frame insertion is referred to as LG Motion Pro. By setting this to the highest setting, you are getting the full black frame insertion effect. And when running Super Mario Brothers on the Tink 5X again, black frame insertion greatly reduced the motion blur we saw earlier. Even when I slow down the action to a 10% speed, you can tell the motion blur is greatly reduced when compared to the footage seen earlier without black frame insertion. But there's a catch. When you insert black frame insertion, the image gets much, much dimmer, as you can see between the first shot and the second shot. And this may be a deal breaker for some of you. In 2022, Mike Chi introduced the ability to inject HDR into the RetroTINK 5X to offset how dim your screen gets with black frame insertion. But there was a catch to that as well. The RetroTINK 5X's HDR lacked the proper color space conversion and tone mapping, which resulted in inaccurate and strange colors distorting the image. Mike Chi has often referred to this as fake HDR. And as you can see here, with HDR activated on the RetroTINK 5X, we started to see odd color inaccuracies appear where they shouldn't, which distorted the image. Now, if you weren't playing a game next to a CRT, you might be oblivious to this inaccuracy, but it's definitely there and it's bothersome to a lot of gamers. But now we have the extra horsepower in the RetroTINK 4K, which can display the HDR10 standard at an uncompressed RGB 444 in the proper color space, giving you a bright HDR image with accurate color reproduction. So now, yes, finally, with the RetroTINK 4K, you can have the amazing, accurate phosphor and scanline filter emulation with exceptional reduction in motion blur through black frame insertion, with the usual dim picture being completely offset by HDR10. Now, is it as perfect and blur-free as a CRT? No, and it never will be because of the sample and hold panel refresh in LCDs and OLEDs, but damn is it close. It is so close. Even when I reduce the speed of the game down to only 10%, man, it's really impressive. Although it's still just a little dimmer than the CRT, despite the flat panel using HDR10. I think with the introduction of brighter OLED displays in the future, this probably won't be an issue for much longer. So can the RetroTINK 4K successfully eliminate the motion blur found in flat panels and bring motion on par with CRTs? I mean, unless you're extremely sensitive to motion blur, yeah, pretty much. Sitting back on the sofa playing Super Mario Brothers with the HDR600 TVL profile on the RetroTINK 4K, it looks identical to the PVM sitting next to it without any perceptible motion blur to my eye. So yes, I consider this another win for the RetroTINK 4K. And last but not least, lag. All right, now for some of you, this is probably the biggest advantage CRTs have over scalers, and you'll probably never part with your CRT because of it. CRT televisions have virtually zero lag. Though over the years, flat panel displays have gotten much better at reducing input latency. According to ratings.com or artings.com, whatever you call it, my LG G1 OLED has slightly over 10 milliseconds of input lag, which is just over half of a frame of lag, as one frame is between 16 and 17 milliseconds at 60 hertz. Big caveat here though, the LG G1 OLED has excellent performance when it comes to latency, and not all flat panels are created equal in this respect, so your results may differ than mine. The question now becomes how much more additional lag gets added with an analog to digital scaler like the RetroTINK 
4K. I will also say another huge caveat, the best way to test input lag is with a device that is specifically designed to measure input latency, like the Time Sleuth. Unfortunately, I don't have one of those, so I'm using the 240p Test Suite's lag testing program. Here, I'm outputting RGB to a PVM and to the RetroTINK 4K using a GSCART switch, which has dual analog output. With the 240p Test Suite, you simply let the program run, and then you take a photo of the CRT and the flat screen at the same time in the same picture. This photo will give you a close approximation of the latency found in your flat panel. Again, these aren't super accurate hard numbers. You'll need a time sleuth for that. Now at 4K 60 Hertz without HDR, the RetroTINK 4K's frame lock mode gave me some really impressive results at well under a frame of lag. Frame lock mode is great for most 240p games that don't switch between progressive and interlaced modes. For those games, or for systems that output some really unique refresh rates like the Neo Geo and other arcade boards, Genlock or Triple Buffer modes should be used. In my testing, Genlock and Triple Buffer mode resulted in just about a frame of lag without HDR. However, Mike tells me that with Genlock mode, the latency number should actually go down over time to readings that are consistent with frame lock mode. I don't have a time sleuth to independently confirm this, so Hopefully Bob from RetroRGB will discuss this in his deep dive of the RetroTINK 4K after its retail release. And best news of all, when you inject HDR into the RetroTINK 4K's image, it had zero effect on those latency numbers. So whether you're playing in SDR or HDR modes, you're getting the same great performance out of the RetroTINK 4K. But wait, it gets better. The RetroTINK 4K can also output 1080p and 1440p at 120 hertz, which will reduce these latency numbers even further. Also, if your TV doesn't support black frame insertion, the RetroTINK 4K can even provide black frame insertion itself in this mode. So if latency is your number one priority when playing retro games, you can play at 1080p at 120 hertz and eliminate motion blur with the RetroTINK's built-in internal black frame insertion. At this mode, latency testing came in at less than a quarter of a frame of lag while in frame lock mode, which is exceptionally low. So can the RetroTINK 4K overcome the advantage that CRTs have with input lag? I mean, look, if you're a speedrunner or a professional Smash Brothers player or just a basic psychopath, these latency numbers are going to be unacceptable to you no matter how low they get. I mean, by all means, hang on to your trusty CRT. That's cool. But for the vast majority of gamers out there, the low latency figures that we're seeing here with the RetroTINK 4K, input lag is going to be imperceptible. I'd say that's another reason to consider replacing your CRT with the RetroTINK 4K. And yeah, other than that, I can't really think of any other reason why you'd want to hang on to your CRT. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Nothing's really... Nothing's really coming to mind. Oh. Ooh! <laughs> Try harder, Mike G!